One of the defining traits of humans is walking upright on two legs. This feature, it seems, was inherited from our Australopithecine ancestors and played a significant role in the development of the Homo genus, including our own species. And it's not just about freeing up our hands. Walking upright also led to a wider pelvis in women, which negatively impacted their physical abilities, particularly running efficiency. As a result, this increased the need for a clearer division of roles and better group organization for survival. Additionally, bipedalism meant that human infants were born, so to speak, less developed and independent compared to other animals, giving them a long childhood. During this time, they could learn and acquire essential skills. About 52,000 years ago, during one of Earth's warmer periods, our ancestors established a foothold in what is now Turkey and began gradually spreading into southern Europe. Back then, Homo sapiens wasn't alone. Other human species still roamed the planet. Europe, for example, was home to Neanderthals. Denisovans lived in Asia. And on the island of Flores in Indonesia, the so-called hobbits, the short-statured Flores people, thrived. However, our species stood out with its extraordinary ability to spread across vast geographies, during which the other human species mysteriously vanished. Here's an interesting point. Neanderthals were stockier and stronger than our ancestors. As Dr. Leonid Vishnyatsky once wrote, if they had survived to modern times, gold medals in Olympic strength sports would surely have been theirs. Our ancestors, on the other hand, were leaner and longer-legged, seemingly capable of covering great distances while expending less energy, a crucial advantage not only for expansion, but also for hunting. It's quite possible that even without constant armed conflict, our ancestors gradually outcompeted Neanderthals, partly assimilating them. Running on two legs may have reduced overall speed. Only a few exceptionally trained humans can reach speeds of 40 kilometers per hour. In contrast, many quadrupeds easily hit 60 to 80 kilometers per hour, with some reaching 100. But humans made up for their lack of speed with endurance. As a result, most of us, with proper training, can develop the ability to run not just marathons, but ultramarathons where a person can run for days on end. This trait proved incredibly useful. Hunting with cold weapons, whether a spear or arrow, didn't always result in a quick kill. Often, animals were merely wounded, leading to long chases. There's even a theory that the constant activity of our ancestors led to high levels of lactic acid in their muscles, a byproduct of glucose metabolism. This supposedly made human flesh less appetizing to predators. Thus, our ancestors, especially those running across fields with sharp sticks, weren't exactly a predator's top choice. Still, human traits go beyond just bipedalism and endurance. Our brain can construct an informational and linguistic model of the world, meaning we don't just perceive reality through our senses, but also reflect it internally. This internal model allows us to predict events, replay and analyze them, gain new experiences, and reorganize existing knowledge. In other words, to invent and create. However, such a powerful tool comes with its downsides. As children, humans are primarily attuned to the natural world around them. But as they grow up, they become immersed in this virtual model. The problem lies in the fact that this informational and linguistic reality evolved as an incredible survival tool. As a result, we tend to focus on the negative and threatening aspects of the environment and then store them in our minds for further analysis. That's why the picture of the world inside our heads is often much gloomier than reality itself. Moreover, this internal model of reality can't stand certainty or clarity. You know those moments when you bump into something in a dream and your brain quickly spins a little story to explain why it happened, then files it away as a memory. If you look into the experiments of Cambridge psychologist Frederick Bartlett, the work of neuroscientist Konstantin Anakin, and others, you'll discover that even our memories are often a product of imagination and creativity. Dive deeper into the topic and you'll probably come across experiments showing how the human brain makes decisions and only afterward writes a justification into memory. The test subject is convinced they acted based on free will and specific reasoning, even though those explanations were fabricated by the brain after the decision was already made. But this rabbit hole is a bit off topic for today, so let's leave it to the experts. As Aristotle once said, nature abhors a vacuum, and it seems our brains, or at least some structures within them, absolutely detest it. So, if thunder roars, there must be celestial beings fighting and hurling lightning. The sun rises? That's a deity on its daily journey. Any catastrophe? Divine punishment. 
While ancient people lacked knowledge that accurately reflected reality, they lived in a simple and understandable world built on myths. Now, if we ask about the health of people in distant eras, it's important not to jump to extremes. Average life expectancy was indeed rarely over 40 years, and often closer to 30. But that figure was heavily skewed by high infant mortality. If someone made it to 20, for example, in medieval England, half of those who reached that milestone lived to at least 50 or 55. Imagine you're walking through a forest, and there's a chance a bear or a pack of wolves might attack you. Now think about an invisible world full of bacteria, viruses, and fungi, whose combined biomass outweighs all animals. Sometimes humans become their prey too, and infectious diseases were once a major cause of early deaths. This got worse with the domestication of animals, which gave us diseases like tuberculosis and the rise of cities, perfect for spreading infections. Back then, infant mortality wasn't just about survival of the fittest, but often pure luck, like whether the midwife delivering a baby had clean hands. Despite common myths, people in the past did bathe, but hand-washing as a health habit is surprisingly modern. As pharmacist Kristen Gitter notes, washing your hands can reduce your risk of catching an infection more effectively than any amount of vitamins or supplements. In the 20th century, many countries introduced public health care and antiseptics, and in 1928 Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, the first antibiotic. The results were dramatic. Over the past hundred years, average lifespans in parts of Europe have nearly doubled. To get a true sense of life expectancy, we look at those born in the mid-20th century. Otherwise, we're just dealing with projections that depend on too many variables. But by the mid-20th century, we realized modern medicine wasn't a perfect solution. Heart disease became a leading cause of death. It's hard to say how often this happened in medieval or early modern times, but cases skyrocketed in many countries after the 1950s. If you think this is just because people now live longer so their circulatory systems wear out, think again. Heart disease is the top cause of premature death. In 2016 alone, heart-related issues accounted for over half of all deaths in the U.S. Over 70 million Americans have at least one form of heart disease. Globally, the WHO reports that heart problems are responsible for nearly one in three deaths. After heart disease, cancer ranks second, followed by diabetes, which shows an alarming trend. Back in the 1990s, about 100 million people worldwide had diabetes. By the early 21st century, that number had doubled. Predictions once said there'd be 300 million cases by 2025, but by 2019, we'd already surpassed half a billion. I've mentioned modern diets, refined carbs, excessive sugar, and trans fats before, but they're just part of the story. Most problems have multiple causes. For a deeper dive, I'll refer to Robert Sapolsky's Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Sapolsky isn't a self-help guru. He's a renowned neuroendocrinologist working on gene therapy to protect neurons from diseases. According to his book, Our Most Powerful Survival Tool, the information and language model of the world is also a source of problems. The thing is, both animals and humans have survival mechanisms like stress. It's a program that, in emergencies, uses hormones to speed up the heart and direct blood flow to the muscles. However, when an animal is stressed, it means survival is at stake. So the body redirects all resources to muscle function. This literally drains the digestive and reproductive systems, lowering immunity. It's like during a major war when a government cuts funding for social programs and shifts those resources to the military budget. Robert's book includes examples of experiments where rats were subjected to regular stress. And as a result of frequent blood loss to internal organs and a weakened immune system, they developed stomach ulcers. Robert Sapolsky also details how during stress, the body speeds up the heart and creates higher blood pressure. High blood pressure puts a strain on blood vessels, causing them to develop thicker muscular walls and lose flexibility. This creates a vicious cycle. Chronic stress leads to hypertension, weakens blood vessels, and promotes cholesterol buildup. It can also cause left ventricular hypertrophy and other complications. Stress hormones even raise blood sugar levels, which makes sense biologically. When you're in danger, your muscles need fuel to fight or flee. In nature, stress is usually short-lived. It kicks in during a predator encounter and fades once the threat is gone. But humans have a virtual reality inside their minds, a speech-based, information-rich model of the world that links directly to our physiology. When we imagine a metaphorical lion stalking us, it can feel just as real as the physical threat, keeping stress hormones pumping. That lion, of course, is a stand-in for modern worries. 
Deadlines, loans, mortgages, parenting struggles, workplace drama, you name it. The result? Many of us live in a constant state of stress. Our digestive, reproductive, and immune systems are deprived of resources while the heart pumps sugar-rich blood to muscles that don't need it since we're just sitting on a couch or at a desk. In the end, the whole system crashes. Was stress this big of a problem in the past? Probably not. Robert Sapolsky observed an interesting phenomenon in primates. The lowest ranking members of a troop experience the most stress. However, when troops are constantly shuffled, stress levels rise across the board because everyone must constantly re-establish their rank. By that logic, the Middle Ages were likely tough but less stressful in some ways. People had fewer choices, and their place in society was largely determined by birth. A modern joke sums it up. Serfdom guaranteed full employment. Life was simpler, and a priest could explain the whole world to you in a few sentences. Religion, for its part, could reduce stress or amplify it. Many spiritual practices originally aimed to relieve stress, but the most successful ones evolved into institutions designed to control society. That's where the stick, fear of eternal torment, came into play alongside the carrot. Still, for peasants or artisans, there wasn't much time for self-reflection. They were too busy staying active and engaged in daily tasks. If you're looking to manage stress, there are countless psychological and spiritual practices out there. But let's be honest, most of us aren't going to stick to those paths. Fortunately, there's a straightforward way to reduce the harm caused by stress and modern diets, physical activity. In fact, stress and poor nutrition hit us so hard because humanity has embraced a sedentary lifestyle. Our brains are hardwired to focus on negative information and conserve energy, which worked fine when food was scarce but backfires in today's world of easy calories and constant stress. It's hard to pinpoint exactly how exercise helps combat stress. Some say it triggers the release of endorphins, those feel-good chemicals that reduce pain and promote a sense of harmony. Others view exercise as a controlled form of short-term stress that strengthens the body. Robert Sapolsky leans toward the idea that physical activity improves overall health, making stress less damaging to a well-prepared body. There's plenty of research on the benefits of different types of exercise. But beware of bloggers who flaunt studies with tiny sample sizes. I focused on studies with larger groups. For example, a study of 16,000 older women found that walking just a thousand steps a day reduced mortality by over a quarter compared to those who were less active. Another study noted that people over 40 who walked for more than an hour a day spent less on medical bills and medication. Researchers from the University of Leicester analyzed data from over 400,000 people and found that those who walk briskly at speeds of six and a half kilometers per hour or more have longer telomeres, a marker of biological age. In simple terms, fast walkers age more slowly. On top of that, men who walk quickly are 29% less likely to die from cancer, women 26% less likely, and the risk of dementia drops by an impressive 71% for both genders. Like I mentioned earlier, we don't know much about heart disease in the Middle Ages, but we do have examples from modern hunter-gatherer tribes. For instance, the Hadza in Africa don't suffer from it. Anthropologist Herman Ponser compared them to Scottish postmen in Glasgow. He noted that those walking over 15,000 steps daily had cardiovascular health comparable to Tanzanian hunters. Running also gets plenty of attention. A review of 14 studies covering over 200,000 people found that regular jogging reduces all-cause mortality by about 30%. Another study showed that consistent jogging adds six years and two months to men's lives and five years and six months to women's. One study, conducted from the late 1990s to 2014, analyzed data from over 400,000 Americans. It found that just one hour of aerobic exercise per week lowered the risk of early death by 15%, Three hours dropped it by 27%, but more isn't always better. The sweet spot seems to be two to two and a half hours weekly. While humans are built for endurance running, doing too much can backfire. For example, professional footballers and long distance runners logging more than 20 to 30 kilometers per week often experience lower testosterone levels. Female athletes are more likely to develop reproductive system dysfunction. Moderate exercise generally strengthens bones, but 30-year-old athletes running 20 to 30 kilometers weekly may suffer from decalcification of their bones. It's important to understand that while physical activity is essential, sports are a different game. Sports focus on results in narrow fields, and the idea that more is better for health doesn't hold up. That said, even professional athletes aren't doomed. 
Finnish researchers studied 900 male pro athletes and compared their lifespans to their non-athletic brothers. They found that endurance athletes lived two years and four months longer than their non-athletic siblings. Mixed sport athletes lived about two years and two months longer. Weightlifters, however, had lifespans similar to non-athletes. Another fascinating study analyzed over 1,500 professional bodybuilders who competed between the late 1940s and early 2010s. It showed that bodybuilders aged 30 to 50 died two to three times more often than the general population. I suspect this isn't due to weightlifting itself. Research shows that while marathoners tend to live longer than weightlifters, the latter's lifespans are on par with those of average people. When we're not talking about elite sports though, strength training is undoubtedly beneficial. As we age, we lose muscle mass. Still, I'd be cautious about trainers claiming you shouldn't combine strength and cardio to maximize muscle growth. In fact, cardio, preferably outdoors, is the most beneficial type of exercise overall. That doesn't mean you need to set running records. If you're overweight or have joint issues, walking, especially Nordic walking, is a much better option. It reduces joint strain by 30% and engages more muscles. Over 80% of teenagers worldwide lack sufficient physical activity. Type 2 diabetes in children is no longer rare. And I'm not even getting into obesity, depression, and musculoskeletal issues, which are skyrocketing even in developed countries. Inactive lifestyles come with a host of symptoms, frequent headaches, irritability, nervousness, insomnia, chronic fatigue, and reduced productivity. Poor brain circulation weakens memory, decreases focus, and impairs coordination. Fun fact, if you're solving crosswords or reading to keep your brain sharp, here's something to consider. According to biologist and professor Vyacheslav Dubinin, two-thirds of our brain's neurons are dedicated to movement, while only a third handle vision, hearing, thought, and emotions. So, physical activity stimulates the brain far more than pondering the meaning of life. The WHO reports that at least 5 million people die prematurely every year due to lack of exercise. In rough terms, the couch has claimed more lives in the 21st century than World War II. I've mentioned examples of how exercise extends lifespan. Take Sima Mika, who at 92 starts her day with a 3-kilometer jog followed by strength training. Pretty inspiring, right? But for me, that's not the main point. Social media is flooded with memes about people turning into total wrecks after 30. Many accept this as inevitable. Our brains, always eager to conserve energy, because for most of history, energy was hard-earned. Love to rationalize this. People dismiss longevity as fate. You'll live as long as you're meant to. This same mindset excuses bad habits. Any illness can be blamed on genetics, as if we're powerless. And yet, for thousands of years, humans have invented tools to avoid physical labor. Now, when around 60% of people work office jobs, we've traded physical effort for chairs. But those same chairs and our comfy couches have become traps. On one hand, the modern world offers countless ways to stay healthy. On the other, our innate drive to rest could spell disaster, not just for individuals, but for civilization itself. As the Strugatsky brothers wrote, humanity's story may not end in the roar of a cosmic catastrophe, a nuclear war, or the pressures of overpopulation, but in the quiet, comfortable lull of prosperity.